Good, good morning to everybody. Good morning to everybody online. Um, if you're visiting the church this morning, we, we hope, our, our, our prayer always is that if you're here, that you actually leave encouraged, you leave better, because, you know, we don't, we don't belong to the church that beats you up. We belong to the church that builds you up. And the Holy Spirit comes to build you up in your most holy faith. And just thank God what he's doing in the, in the church. Thank God what he's doing. Just, you know, globally, God is just moving by his spirit, just preparing the church to speak in the nations. And it's, it's just absolutely amazing. And a huge happy birthday to uh, my wife, Pastor Zelda, this morning. I love this time of the year because um, we're officially two years apart. And as most of the church will know, if you're a visitor this morning, you'll already know that I'm younger. And uh, actually, I, I, turned, I turned to Zelda this morning. I said, I, I don't know. And I was being genuine. I said, Zelda, what, what age actually am I? I can't remember. Um, which is not good, church. Because I was trying to kind up in my mind um, <clears throat> how long I've been saved. And actually, I just realized that in November this year, I'm saved 40 years. Which I used, to, I used to hear people in the church say, I'm here, I'm saved 40 years. I'm saved 50 years. And I was thinking, you know, I'm never going to reach that milestone. And... And I just sat there saying, thank God for the grace that 40 years ago, this year, I'll be able to say, God saved me. And you know what? you know what's even better, church? God keeps you. You don't keep yourself. He keeps you. And he is an amazing, wonderful, wonderful God. Um, I, I began a journey, and I hope you don't mind me giving uh, a little bit of, uh, sort of a brief, a little bit of testimony. But I'm saved 40 years ago, but I began a journey 18 years ago. Um, way, way before we, we started to pastor this church and, and uh, we began a, a journey. And I, I have to tell you, church, that has completely changed my life. Ab- absolutely, radically changed my life. And I, I didn't think I needed the journey because sometimes we think that, you know, in our journeys with God, we have everything. And suddenly you see another aspect of God and it just blows, it blows your mind. And I didn't think I needed the journey that I was on. I wasn't looking for a different version of doctrine or church or, or what I believed about God. I wasn't, I wasn't looking for that. And in, in many ways, a little bit like Jacob, I stumbled into something. I stumbled into grace. And I stumbled into the cross. And I stumbled into the new covenant without any intention in my part. And I have to tell you, this is... This is, this is why you hear me preach the way I preach in this church. It was not intentional, but it absolutely radically transformed everything that I was up until that point as a Christian. And I do have to say, and I do have to give credit not only to Zelda, but to, to my four kids. I have to say to them all this morning, not one of them resisted what had happened in my spirit. Every one of them embraced grace. Now, I had to unravel an awful lot of thinking but they just came into grace. And, and even when I, uh, at times, I have to tell you, 18 years ago, it was a very lonely road because not everybody jumps up and down when you mention grace. If you mention grace throughout Northern Ireland today or any part of region, any nation that you're from, I can assure you when they hear grace, there will be some people who will be very resistant to grace because they, they misunderstand the whole purpose of grace. And my, my family, in times when I had a little bit of doubt and possibly a little bit of opposition to this, my, I have to say that was my family said, just keep going with this message. Keep going with, with what's in your spirit. And now today, even in our own church here this morning, we have many people that have added themselves to that vision and to that grace. And this is why the house is starting to grow and to build. And now I see the whole world through a different lens. In fact, I'm going to tell you, when Zelda and I listen to preachers and, and we listen to people's conversations, we see every Bible verse through the lens of grace. Like, like I can look at a verse now after, it's, after the 18 years journey and I would think, I can't even believe I didn't see what I seen in that verse. It's a little bit like in Luke when I, I read this morning when they walked in with the two to the road to a mess and then Jesus appears in the room and he appears in the room, they thought he was a ghost and then he, he eats fish so they understand that this is not a ghost, this is the resurrected Christ that he's in the room. But it says that he would be known in the breaking of bread. And when they broke bread, their eyes were open. And sometimes, church, this is what happens. In fact, a lot of times, this is what happens in our lives. There has to be a revelation comes that your eyes become opened. Because when you think you know everything about God, guess what? You've got to play catch up because there's something that you're going to find out about him. Because it's from glory to glory. 
And so when I, I see my whole wor- world very different, it's a bit like Alice in Wonderland. When she looks through the looking glass, she sees a different world. I, I have had to put on grace glasses, new covenant glasses, and I see church in the world completely different. And I, I didn't know it, and I wrote this down because I'm, I'm writing something at the minute, and I wrote this down. I, I was a recovering legalist. And I didn't know I was a recovering legalist because I was addicted to religion. And in some ways, we are all addicted to religion. Mankind is. Amen. Amen. You like the fact that I said I'm a recovering legalist. You, you all like that, but you're probably all the same. And I, I, when I began those, that journey, it was, a, it was a slow journey of unraveling my version of God. Because sometimes we can have our versions of God that are not Bible versions of God. And I, I began to unravel um, a, a version of God that it suited me, or at least at that point, that's what I knew. So I, I, don't, think, I don't think I was trying to be deceptive. This is just all that I knew until that, that first revelation. I'm not going to talk about it this morning, what it was. But, but, but I, well, I, let me just say to you, the first revelation I got was, was not a phrase, but it's something in my spirit was God was, and it was here, and I was on my own. And I heard, I heard the word of the Lord say, I'm actually for you and not against you. And that, that began to change me. And, and it's been a slow but wonderful journey unraveling God and seeing for the first time the revelation of grace and my place in God. What my true identity is in God. And, and now I term, do you know what I term the new covenant as? The real gospel. The new, the new, when Jesus said, this is the new covenant in my blood, he, and then you hear the word gospel, they're not two different things. The new covenant and the gospel are one and the same. Give me a big amen if you believe it in the hall. And now I see the real gospel, which is the empowerment of men. And actually, I'm going to tell you, it's going to be the awakening of a global revival. Because those that are going to come into the church in the end time and nations that are going to come over to the Lord are going to be so riddled by sin that if you have a law-driven legalist message, they're not going to last in your church. And you're going to have to have the right foundation. And the Holy Spirit is switching that we have the right foundation. That when the vilest of sinners come in, we know that they can receive the wonder of grace in the house. And this is what he's been doing. This is what the Holy Spirit, this is why you see, see when you see all the shaking in your nations and all the turmoil, political, financial, everything, all of the stuff that's coming and the stuff that's not coming, the Holy Spirit is working the church. Because the church is here for the healing of the nations. And so this gospel of grace, as Andrew Murray, if you don't know who Andrew Murray is, he's one of the the great latter Puritans. You should his book is actually in the bookstore. You should read Andrew Andrew Murray's book on the on the two covenant, but they never talk about mighty men of God. Do you remember the mighty men of God conferences we all used to go to? And we all wanted to be like the mighty man of God at the end of the conference. There, there is no such thing as mighty man of God. But there is such a thing as men who have been made mighty by the covenant. That's, that's how all the Puritans spoke. When they understood the covenant, they became strong because they're looking to the Lord. Oh, man. That was for free this morning. But it's a great quote. And... and I have to tell you, the journey wasn't necessarily for me and my family a change in doctrine. We are well taught in doctrine. We have a great heritage. Sometimes they'll and me laugh when we, when we meet all our people that don't understand our tradition or heritage. We, we, we had deep waters. We had deep waters of teaching in our spirits. And I am thank God for it, by the way. It's helped me to unlock so many scriptures. But, but when you can have doctrine but not have encounter... Information is not the same as revelation. And what happened to me was, was I got a revelation in my spirit about him. It's a bit like Peter when Peter was, was with him and, and, and Peter said, who do men say that I am? And Peter said, well, you're the Christ. You're the Christ, the son of the living God. And then Jesus said, you've got this by revelation because flesh and blood, information hasn't revealed this, but the spirit has revealed this to you. Right? So it becomes revelation, 
and has allowed me to unlock what it means to be in Christ, in God, in grace, in new covenant. Because if you're a believer here this morning, you're in all of those. And I, I want to take some, I guess it's because we have a conference in three weeks. I said to Zella, I'm going to go back to basics. I, I'm going to call this Grace 101. So next, this week, next week, and the third week before the conference, I'm just going to lay some really simple thoughts about the new covenant and about your standing and your state in the new covenant. And if you feel it's too simple, keep your comments to yourself. <laughs> but I, I actually think this morning the church is more ready now than it was seven years ago when we took over this church to hear what we're going to say this morning. And I, I actually think that it's going to be a little bit of an expansion in the house a little bit of an expansion of the wine scene. I think the Holy Spirit's going to deposit something in to your identity. And, and you're going to say, I, I'm hoping you're going to say at the end, I see that was good for me this morning. And you're not going to say, great preacher. You know what you're going to say at the end of it? Great Christ. Great God. Great grace. Give me a big amen. I'm missing, I'm missing my water. Uh, could you? We say amen this morning. Thank God for those. Thank you, Joel. Awesome. So this is what's in my heart this morning. And so I want to step a little bit into, uh, again, into Revelation. And I might be a little bit bold this morning, Easter Sunday morning, but I pray something will resurrect in your heart that you will have joy because you, you were not called under a suppressed life or, or a could-do-better life. Or a spiritual gym membership life where you, you're on the treadmill and you get off. You get on the treadmill again and you fail. And you're on the treadmill again and you fail. Just cancel your spiritual gym membership. You don't need to be. You don't, you don't even go anyway. Just cancel it. You're not looking for a blessed life. Jesus said, I've come to give you life and going to give you abundant life. I'm going to give you life that's overflow and joyful and blessed. Surely Christians should have that life. Amen. Good days, better outcomes, as the psalmist said, lines have fallen to me in, in pleasant places. So we're going to talk a little bit about some stuff this morning. <clears throat> I think one of the big problems in our church is language. I think we all hear the same thing, but we all interpret what we hear in very different ways. And you, I've, I've realized when I preach in the church that what, and, and I guess this is what the Holy Spirit does, and I, and I guess it's to do with your journey. I guess it's to do with your background. Sometimes it's to do with how open your heart is to receive. Sometimes it's the first time you're going to hear something. I, I, I do understand that we all have to be on a journey. So if, if this morning this is the first time you're going to hear what I'm going to say, don't throw everything out. Just say, okay, I'm, I'm going to listen to that, and I'm going to check this guy out to see if he's right or wrong. And if I'm wrong, sack me. But, but I, I, I think I'm right because I think he's good. And I think, I think the problem is language. We're, we're all saying the same thing, but we're all interpreting it a different way. So when you hear grace, what happens in your mind and your spirit when you hear grace? For some people, they say, oh, it's amazing. It's given me so much life. For other people, they say, I'm afraid of grace because I think if you preach grace, the church is going to sin more. And then we say the crazy, craziest term, grace is the license to sin. And it's like an anathema. It's like, don't ever say that to me. It's, we hear righteousness. We're, we, we're not sure. We see holiness. Some churches think it's about what they were or what they don't were. And... and you, you begin to interpret holiness and righteousness and the law, the law of God. Well, what is the law of God? And I'm going to break that down in the next couple of weeks. But we hear all of these things. And what happens in a Sunday morning service, most believers sit in a Sunday morning church somewhere between Moses and Jesus. Like most, most believers sit in church where they've got out of Egypt. Everybody says, I'm saved. We're probably in unity there. We all say we're saved, but we haven't lived in the promised land. And the promised land, by the way, if you do typology in scripture, is not heaven. You shouldn't sing, we're going to go to the promised land someday. The promised land for the New Testament believer is the kingdom of God. 
and you're already in the promised land. You're already in the kingdom, right? But we, don't, we can't seem to get beyond salvation and living full in this abundant life that Jesus said. So we're sitting somewhere between law and grace. And you know what the Bible calls that? Mixture. And you know what happens to mixture? It kills everybody. That's why in Revelation, the writer says, I'd rather you be hot or cold. It's not about fervent. I'd rather you be law or grace, one or the other. But don't be mixture because it's lukewarm. Is that okay so far? So we, we want to unravel that this morning. And, and I want to speak. I don't know where we have that. But I want to speak on the grace of right standing. The grace or the gift of right standing. Because you see, we've, we've just sung about the cross and the resurrection. And this is going to be the purpose of the cross. This is, this is 101. If you do not know you're righteous, this is going to be really difficult for you to live a Christian life. The grace of right standing. When the Bible talks about grace, everybody say grace. It's not grace plus. Amen. It's not grace but. I like grace but. Have you ever heard that? I like grace but. It's not grace, but it's grace and. It's not grace and. It's not grace plus works. It's grace full stop. Did we all get that this morning? It's grace full stop. It's grace period. You do not qualify grace because grace is a person. I know you have the doctrine of grace if you're from a reformed background. And I, I love some of the reform stuff. It's amazing. But, but you, do not, you do not qualify grace because grace is a person. It is not Jesus plus works. Is that better for me to say that to you? <clears throat> Bible says in Colossians, in him dwells the fullness of the Godhead in bodily form. You know what it says about us? And we are complete in him. So if you're in Jesus this morning, you're in completion. You are complete. You may not feel complete, but the Bible says you're complete in him. Give me a huge amen this morning. You don't get saved, and we'll give this verse later on, but you don't get saved by grace through faith plus works. It's even hard to say. You get saved, everybody said, you get saved by? Through faith. Through belief. You don't add works to it. You don't get saved by grace and then work your wee socks off the rest of your life to try and live the Christian life. You knew when you got saved on the first day it was grace. You knew there was nothing you could do, whether it was in the service. I got saved at home. I didn't get saved in the church. I got saved at home. My father led me to the Lord 40 years ago in the front living room down at the end of this drive. We got saved 40 years ago. And, and I got saved by grace, and I knew that day there was nothing I could do to get saved except it was by grace. So when you all got saved, and, I, and I, forgive me, I don't like this term coming to faith. I like the term saved. You got saved. But when you got saved, it was by grace. And you believed it's called through faith. Amen. It's not, it's not, listen, I'm just really going to kneel it this morning. And I'm going to hit your little legalist mindset, say, man, I'm just going to shoot right into it this morning. It's not 99% grace and 1% works. Because that's called grace plus. 1% works is 99% pride. That's what it is. You get saved by grace and you live by grace. Because the Father rejects everything that's not Jesus. Everything. It has to be all Him, church. And I'm going to show you this morning that it's all Him, it's all the cross, and it's all about God. And you will say at the end, we have an amazing Savior. When people get saved or in church for a while, sin a little less, 
live a little better, begin to get prosperous, know a few Greek words, know how to use your version of the Bible, can send we promises to friends, which is all good, by the way. I'm not knocking this, not trying to make light of it. You begin unconsciously to start in grace, but to add some other things to it. And you don't realize you're adding it to it. Bring 30 people into the church this morning that have never been in church and are just wild with sin, and you will begin to see how much you've added to your grace plus. Because they may sit in your seat and they may not behave in church the way we behave in church. Amen. When you get saved, it's all grace. And we need to kneel the right gospel that the church would come alive. And if you have any legalism in you or any religion in you, even now you'll be resisting what I'm saying in the hall. And it's going to be a little bit like Acts 13 and verse 50 when Paul and Barnabas preached grace. It didn't say the heathen or the Roman centurion. It said the godly women come out and opposed them. I, I can't actually get my head around that. That the people who had been in church a long time and who were the godly women actually opposed the message of grace. But I can't tell you if you catch it, the next time you sing Amazing Grace, High Sweet the Sign, you'll sing it with gusto. You'll sing it with trust because you will say, This has been only Amazing Grace. Give me an amen this morning. I'm going to make some statements, and the statement I'm going to say here, if you don't remember anything else, probably write it down, leave with this one. Grace has brought you into right standing with God. Grace has brought you into right standing with God. If you believe, you are righteous. Yes or no? Why are you righteous? I'm going to show you. Because of the cross. You have been, you have been made in right relationship with God because of the blood. This is, this is the hope this is the hub of the church. This is, this is the hub of, of every service you will go to here in this, in this province this morning. Am I righteous because of the cross or do I need to debate righteousness in the church? Because really what you need to ask yourself the question, am I really, fully, wholly righteous before God? Really, really church, really. And we theologically abuse and dissect righteousness, and what we're actually doing, church, both at the table and at the cross, we are questioning the finished work of the cross. Because Jesus didn't say, it's finished, now there's more to do. Jesus said, Father, it's finished. It's finished. And we qualify righteousness, and we confuse the hearer, and the reason why we confuse, because we're still sin-focused, or we, you, we, we have a misplaced idea of holiness. By the way, holiness is never to bar you. I mean, when Jesus died, the veil was broken. So why would then we have to, when we talk about holiness, bring another bar or level into the church? Holiness is not to bar you. Holiness was to bring you to God. Holiness makes you whole, right? So, so what happens is we hear sin and sanctification and holiness... And we bring snare and guilt on people who God has called and made righteous. And it's an offense to a legalist mind driven mindset to declare you are righteous without qualification. And I'm going to say it you are righteous without qualification. Righteous without qualification. You know how I knew that this morning? Because the Bible tells me righteousness is a gift. It's called the gift of, now the Holy Spirit puts in your heart this morning before you leave to send me to my bank account 500 pounds 
First of all, I'm going to say you're definitely listening to the Holy Spirit. Like what I would actually say is you're spiritual people. But on Monday, if I pay you back, it's no longer a gift. And sometimes what we're doing with righteousness, we're receiving righteousness, and now we're trying to pay God back for the gift. When you try to pay God back or you try to earn righteousness, it is no longer a gift. It's no longer a gift. Am I making sense? Don't worry, we're getting into scriptures. Just don't think I'm going to make statements. We're going to get into the scriptures. Grace has brought you into right standing. This is why we're in a better covenant. This is why we have better promises. Otherwise, we're under Pastor Moses this morning. I'd rather be under Jesus, no matter how great Pastor Moses was. Grace has brought you into right standing, right relationship with God, and it's called a gift. It's called the gift of righteousness. The gift of God has made you righteous. This is, I know this is Sunday school stuff but I don't think the big church knows. In the book of Romans, Romans is one of the most pivotal books in all of the Bible. Romans 5, 6, 7, 8. Rich, 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 rich. In the book of Romans chapter 5, you get a spiritual bombshell. Like it is is like somebody just threw a grenade in the middle of the church. Boom. It blew all your theology out of the water. And it throws all of it out of the water. And it throws out any sense of earning or anything else that righteousness could be a gift. And Paul the Apostle uses Abraham. Do you, do you know what the Bible says? I think it might even be in Isaiah. Look on the Abraham, your father. And look on the Sarah, your mother. And he, he's called the father of faith. In fact, we come under the blessing of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And the Galatian writer tells us through the seed, which is one, which is Christ. And we come under this whole blessing of what God said. I'm going to swear to Abraham. And know what he does? No matter how much he loves Abraham, when he makes covenant with Abraham, he puts him to sleep and he said, I'll do it by myself. Because I know they're not going to be able to keep their side of the covenant. And I, by myself, says the Lord will do this. And so what he does, he, he, Paul talks about Abraham. So Abraham's significant in, in Christ, Christian faith. And Abraham is the father. He is the, you know what he's called? He's called the father of faith. He shows us how righteousness works. <clears throat> and he shows us that it's only by grace. He, he actually, Paul actually disqualifies works and good behavior and performance of any time to bring right relationship with God because you, your standing in righteousness is only by grace, church. Be a bit more relaxed this morning. Smile up at me this morning because I'm not going to say anything's going to hurt you. I'm going to say something's going to heal you. Amen. Romans, Romans chapter 4, I think we have it. Romans chapter 4, verse 2. Paul's, Paul's doing this argument back and forward. Paul says, if Abraham was justified, I, I was going to do a play on words this morning. Um, if your first language is in English, I'm not sure if you'll get this, but it's just if I'd. Okay? I'll show you that. Just if I'd. Paul, Abraham was justified. If Abraham was justified by works, he's something to boast about, but not before God. <laughs> like if you want to boast about it, great. There might be somebody in your discipleship group thinks you're fantastic, but not God. Not God. And the writer in Romans excludes, excludes works. He excludes grace plus to anything that will mar your right standing before God. Now, I have to tell you, church, if you don't get this, if you don't get this, you will default like I was to, to being addicted to religion. And you may like, remember Martin Luther? Martin Luther is on his knees. And we, you see, what we do, because we come from a slightly different tradition, in the Catholic tradition, we, we, we say poor Catholics and they don't really know what we know. But I can tell you, our churches are saturated in the same thing. And so what we do is we say poor Martin Luther, he's on his knees and he gets this word, the just shall live by faith. 
And so that you might have, if you don't get it, you have religion of steps and penance and mountains. You might want to climb Slamish Mountain because for some reason holy men climb mountains. <laughs> you might have to do it, which they do in Ireland. They will climb mountains in their bare feet till their feet bleed. And the Bible says the just shall live by faith. God says, see all of that that you're doing? It's nothing before me. We wouldn't have that in the Pentecostal church or the evangelical world, no. But we do have clothes and hats and revival prayer meetings. And they become a work. If you can't say amen, say ouch at that one. But it's true. Because we don't think we have any religion in spiritful churches. You could boast about works, but don't do it before God. Is that is not what justifies you. That is not what makes you, you righteous before God. Right standing has nothing to do with works. This could be my last message ever. I feel it. I feel it in the hall. Right standing has nothing to do with works. I said right standing has nothing to do with works. Romans 5 and 3 expands. Paul says, what does the Bible say? <laughs> it's, good. it's a good place to start, isn't it? Isn't it a good place to say, well, I, I like your church. Do you know what traditions are in churches? The democracy of the dead. This is what they are. Some of them are good. Some of them need bend. But what does the Bible say? Not your favorite preacher online. What does, not, not me this morning. I don't really care this morning. What does the Bible say? What does the Bible say about, well, what does the Bible say? Well, what does it say? <laughs> Tell us, Pastor Samuel. What does the Bible say? It says that Abraham believed God. Wow. And it was, it was accounted or, or a credit was put into his kind and it was called righteousness or right standing with God. Do you know what justified means when we break it up? Just as I've never sinned. Justified. You see, you believe. Here's the Christian life. Here, here it is. No matter what you hear, no matter what your doctrines are, no matter what you have a master in, a degree in, all of those things are wonderful. But here's what it is. Belief, free gift, righteousness, grace. That's it. Right standing with God is by believing, not by working. We are right believers, not right workers. So I'm not making a play on words. I'm, trying to, I'm just trying to do this simply. And I want you to get this, because if you get this, you won't walk in shame. And you won't walk in guilt. And you won't carry regret. And you won't say, I don't feel worthy. If you get this, if you believe God, God says you're righteous. God says you're in right standing with me. And I'm going to say something that's a shocker. You cannot be out of right standing. Even if there's wrong things. You just haven't caught up with what the Holy Spirit's building in your life, that's all. God will not divorce you. God will not divorce you. Abraham believed God. God gave him right standing. Right standing is called righteousness. Now, I'm going to break this up this morning. And we're all going to Sunday school. It's great to see the kids this morning, by the way. Great to see them. Um, they're all the way to Sunday school this morning with their Easter eggs. God help the parents. So we are going to Sunday school. Who remembers Sunday school? Who remembers the best boy and the best girl prize? Who remembers the verse? Remember the verse? Used to put the verse up. I used to go and used to have a, none of this stuff here. Used to have a, a, a blackboard and then they would rub it out. And then they rub another word out and you had to remember the verse. Great days. Great times in Sunday school. But we are going to Sunday school this morning. And the best boy and girl gets a coffee and cake afterwards. 
Say praise the Lord. That's the most lively you've been all morning. That shows you how unspiritual you are as a church. And I'm going to ask some questions, but I'm not going to ask you the answer. This is called, when God said all by myself, I will do it. I'm going to ask you some questions, and then I'm going to give you the answer. But you might have some questions in your heart, which is fine. Question. Here's the question. What is righteousness? Don't answer. What is righteousness? Most people believe that righteousness is people that do right things. But that's not what it is, church. Question, here's a question. It feels like a conundrum this morning. I think we have this up, actually this one here. It's a longer question. Are you in right standing with God because you do right things? Or do you do right things and I put in brackets because I knew you were all coming this morning most of the time. And I, I don't even need to know you that I know that you don't do right things all of the time. Because the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the mark. So don't tell me you do right things all the time. Otherwise you're the perfect person and you never have a wrong thought. You never shout at the wife and you never kick the cat. Forgive me for cat people this morning. You know how I feel about cats. I believe they all should go to heaven immediately. No, it's not. It's not right. It's just because I'm a dog person. I, I just because I'm a dog person. So you can be, Holy Spirit, come back. You can be in right standing. Are you in right standing because you do right things? Or do you do right things most of the time because you're in right standing? The Greek, let's give a, bit of, a little bit of Greek. I'm trying my best because we have different cultures in the church now, which is a, oh, such a blessing. I'm trying my best, particularly when Eugene and Queen are here. I'm, I'm trying to do French. And the other week, unfortunately, I used a Latin word and I thought it was French. And Eugene said to me, no, no, that was, that was Latin, that wasn't French. So just forgive me. Um, really forgive us. We are very poor with languages. We wish we could be better. Um, Greek. Lexicon on righteousness. You know what it says? It says the state of him who is as he ought to be. The condition acceptable to God. You see, you see righteousness, righteousness is a gift, right? And it's God lifting you and placing you the moment you believe into a right place with him. He, he does this before you try to work it out. Like, like the thief on the cross had no time. He didn't know the doctrine of righteousness. He didn't know the doctrine of, lim of atonement. He didn't know all of those things. The thief on the cross knew nothing. He just said, I believe. Jesus said, you're with me in paradise. Right? So what God does, God, God has to do something the moment you say, I believe. He has to do it very quickly or you'll start to, go, to fault into works immediately. So what, what God does, does is giving you time. God, the moment you receive, there is an immediate exchange comes into your spirit. There's a cutting of the covenant. The old is taken away. The Holy Spirit comes in and he gives you a new heart and he gives you new desires. And there's a moment and it's a resurrection because the Bible says I died with him and I've also rose with him and it becomes a resurrection and it is not a slow resurrection. He lifts you immediately right into the heavenlies with him and he says now you're holy, now you're sanctified, now you're righteous, you're in right standing with God. Hallelujah. And when I stand before the Father, the Father sees you as he sees me. I'm now in right standing. And what it is, my, I'm in the state as a resurrection as I ought to be. It's called righteousness. You receive righteousness. You don't earn it. It's a gift. And the issue really isn't right doing. The issue really in the church is right receiving. We, we, we need to be better receivers in grace. If I receive better as a gift, I would flow better. See, see, I would flow better in life. I, I wouldn't have dysfunction. I would function. I've told you this before. I said on Friday night, 
I'm not trying to overcome sin. And I'm not trying to bear fruit. I'm believing and abiding in the fruit bearer. The one who is the overcoming life. It's his life and my life, right? So it's not a slow process. It's, it's an immediate shift in your state and condition. You're made whole. You're now in righteousness. You receive it as a gift. Um, God has made you righteous as a gift. Romans 5 and 17 says this. It's, it's, it's really lovely, a lovely verse. Much more those who receive. You see what it says? Much more those who receive. I would, like, I would like Farside Church to be better receivers. Much more those who receive the abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign. Some, there's something about receiving, understanding your identity and righteousness that causes a stability in how you walk before the Lord. Because, like, if you don't know you're righteous, you know, and if you, if, you're a, if you come from a legalist mindset of telling saved, sanctified, righteous people that they're not quite there yet, you're, you're, it's like putting well people in the hospital and they never leave the ward. Question, another question, how do you reign in life? I'll give you a simple answer. You'd be a good receiver. You don't get yourself all worked up. You just be a good receiver. Now, I know even while I'm speaking this this morning, because I, I would have thought this way, I'll be saying, but he never, mentioned, he never really mentioned holiness. What about good works? Does the Bible not say we should have good works? Pastor Sam was skimming a lot of verses here this morning. I think he's a bit sketchy. Weak pastor. <laughs> My daddy always taught me if your argument was weak, shout louder. Argue, argument weak, shout here. They, they, they'll not know. <laughs> I hope he didn't do it when he was pastoring here. Amen. <laughs> because he, the problem is, church, and we could spend six weeks in holiness or six, and we've done it in the church. So I, I can't cover it this morning, but we have done it, right? Get the tape. I was used to say, get the tape. <laughs> because we are always looking to qualify the gift of righteousness as grace. Does Ephesians chapter 2 not say we are created for good works? Of course it does. A hundred percent, the Bible says you're created for good works to find out what your purpose is. But good works is a result of right standing and right believing it's not the qualification for righteousness. Jesus was actually asked a question. Do you know Jesus was asked over 300, they reckon, I don't know if this is exactly right, but the, I, I read somewhere where he, he's been asked over 300 questions. You know, people are always asking, it's amazing, they're always asking him questions, mostly the Pharisees. God help the Pharisees. If you'd have been born 2,000 years ago, never been born in the uh, Pharisaical line. You wouldn't want it to be a Pharisee. They were the worst, right? They just got it all wrong. And they knew the Bible more than anybody else. And Jesus was asked about good works. And they say they asked, by the way, 300 questions. But they, they reckon Jesus only ever answered three to four actually directly. Because they were always trying to, because you see, the human nature is we, we don't want to eat of the tree of life. We want to eat of the tree of right and wrong. Good and, this, is where we're, this is where we're mostly, uh, is, it, is it right to play golf on a Sunday? Wrong question. It's just wrong question. You, you're, you're actually asking the wrong question. I would say what brings you to Jesus and brings you to life. Whatever, whatever takes you away from there, don't do it. And for one man, that might be golf. For me, it's not golf at all. Golf has no issue and no hold in my heart at all. But, but, you know, before I got saved, I had a certain type of music that I was fixated. I was so fixated with this type of music that I used to dress like these guys I was telling Luke this morning because I was admiring Luke's shoes and I was telling Luke said they're Dr. Martin's. I said I used to wear a pair of Dr. Martin boots and they were up to here and the white laces and I, this jacket and I followed this certain group and one night my daddy and his friend said to me, we would like to buy the scarf that you have off you and they took the scarf and front of me and gave me two pounds. I like two pounds in 1981. You could buy 20 bags of crisps for that. <laughs> and, and the thing is they took it and in front of me they threw the scarf in the fire. And I love that group. But what I'm trying to say to you is we all have things. See, your thing is not my thing. And I say whatever takes you away from him and his people, Bennett. That's the right question. So they asked. 
That's the question in John 6 and 25, Pharisees again. What shall we do? <laughs> it's, the, it's the same question as they asked at Mount Sinai when the law was, all that you've said we will keep. How did that work out for you, Israel? <laughs> right? <laughs> what shall we do that we might work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said unto them, this is the work of God that you believe. <laughs> did you get it? Did you get the memo? This is the work of God that you believe in him who sent me. What was the qualification for them? What is the qualification for us for righteousness? Is that we believe. Is that we believe. Ephesians 2, 8 says, by grace you have been saved through belief, through faith. It's the gift of God. Now, in every Sunday school lesson, and you're really good, and I'm nearly there, but I, I've just got to, going to try and do something. I hope it doesn't go terribly wrong. But in every Sunday school lesson, we have a diagram. And I know you've all been looking here. You've all been wondering what he's going to do. And he has a diagram. And I'm going to attempt to show you that you cannot earn righteousness, right standing with God. It's a gift. And it's beautiful. And it's all grace. Would you give me a big amen this morning? By the way, just before I write uh, this morning, um, my writing is atrocious. I, I very rarely ever write anymore. I type. I sign things. And um, I feel sometimes like I'm the editor of the Hong Kong Gazette. That's how bad my writing is. I can't read my own writing. I said to Zelda last night, what does that say? What I've written down in a book. Okay. I want to talk about before the cross, and then I want to talk about. I want to talk about after. In fact, can I bring? Can I? You don't mind if I bring the pulpit over a little bit? This is this is going to help me. Is that okay, church? So let me just bring this over, and hopefully the camera can get onto this. Yes, yeah, much much better. Amen. So I want to talk about before the cross. I want to talk about some accounts before the cross. And then I want to talk about some accounts after the cross. Now, before the cross, and what I've done here, by the way, I'm going to, if I write in S, it's for sin. If I write in R, it's for righteousness. And if I write in FR, it's for filthy rags. <laughs> Is that all right? Everybody say amen. Everybody say amen, all right? So before the cross, we, we need a bad person. We, I think what we need is we need a bad person, a good person, and a perfect person. We need a bad person. Who do you think we could write up as the, come on, Sunday school kids. Who do you think we could write up as the bad person? Pastor Samuel. Pastor Sa We've got a bad person up here. I got saved at 14. And before I got saved, I'm going to show you I might have been a bad person. Yes, up to 14. And to be honest, I know that, and I know my dad's here now, and I'm an adult, and I've left home, so he can't chastise me. But there were some things that I did wrong. Um, before, what do you mean, yes, Liz? <laughs> what do you mean, yes, Liz? You didn't know me, Liz. You're surmising I did things wrong. But I, before I was 14, I, I did some things wrong. And I remember on a Sunday going to the local shop, and the girl went into the shop, and she took cigarettes out of the shop. And on a Sunday afternoon before I went to church, I had a wee smoke. But I think it was only seven. So I, I think that was a sin. <laughs> Liz. <laughs> now, Liz. <laughs> um, and it wasn't good, and it was on a Sunday, and it was doubly not good. And I remember my mummy bringing me in. Do you know what mummies used to do in Northern Ireland in the 80s? They used to lick hankies and wipe your face. Jesus, deliver and used to do that, and I remember, because I was chewing chewing gum, because we didn't buy anything on the Sunday, my mommy said to me, you know what she said? Because she smelled the chewing gum, not the cigarettes. Have you been smoking? <laughs> no, mommy. So that's another sin. 
I remember building the bonfire. I was a bonfire builder. If you're not from this nation, you have no idea of the joy that we had in that forest. Building the bonfire. You know, old rusted settees with everything on them. It was, it was awful, right? And I, I remember building the bonfire, but for, for, before we had Greta Thumb, Greta, the eco people, we used to burn tires, and a whole lot of them. And we used, to, we used to take about 500 tires from the other side of the forest, and we used to roll them up, and we had a great fire. And I, they weren't our tires, and have broken the eco rules, so I think it's a lot of sin, according to everybody today. Um, it's an awful lot of asses here at the minute. I remember going to church with my brother in, in uh, a place which is now, uh, um, is it the Pizza in the Pint place? Was it was a church? And I, that was our church. And when we were going there, and I had a pea shooter, my brother had a pea shooter. And I remember there's a lady with a hat, a few down, and we sat in the Sunday service. And we, and I, I think, do you see, to be honest, guys, I, I think without getting in, I, I think that's what I felt like before I got saved. I think it did some good things because I remember I, I like to keep my room tidy so um, there's righteousness there. I think I, I think I had an R there. Um, I was pretty good at school and I went to, mu- I went to music lessons, uh, uh, trombone, piano. Um, I think there's a few, a few R's in there and, and that's how I was before I got saved. And then I, I met this lovely girl called Zelda. When I was 19, but she was 21. And I got, I got saved when I was 14. And Zelda to me is good. Because Zelda got saved when she was five. And so she didn't have my journey. And I have, I have lived with Zelda now for 32 years. And I, I, I never see her doing any wrong. And, and when I look at Zelda, I, 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 I see this, 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 this. I, I just see Zelda as righteous. Love is blind. Marriage is an eye opener. That's what they say. That's what they say. So that's how I see Zelda. She's bound to have done something wrong, hasn't she? I, she's bound to maybe look at somebody a wrong way. We'll put in an AS there because I, 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 uh, I don't think she's always had my dinner ready, so I, I will put another S. She hasn't got as many S's as me, but there's got to be. There's no way we can give her. Are, are you with me this morning? Is that, is that okay? Because she's really good. And uh, So before the cross, and then there was a, there was a, a perfect person. Sorry, you should write this, Elder. And it was, it was Jesus. And you know what Jesus was? Righteous. Bible says he was without sin. He was completely righteous. Completely perfect. It says when they came to tempt him, he didn't yield to it. It says when he came in the volume of the book, he fulfilled every law, every jot, every tittle. He was absolutely, Jesus was absolutely righteous. And do you know what Pilate said? Three times about him, I can't find any fault in him. Oh, what a mighty God this morning. But there is a verse in Isaiah 64 and 6. And do you know what it says? You listen to what I'm going to say? Even your righteousness is filthy rags. Did you get it? Even your righteousness, God says, is just filthy rags. What happened after the cross? Well, there's a verse in the Bible. I don't think I'm going to do anything else after this. But there's a verse in the Bible that says he became sin. So this righteous, perfect person became sin. 
that knew no sin, that I would become the righteousness or I'd have right standing. And so what happened is what happened was Jesus took all of your sin. All of it. Every, all of the anger, the justice, everything was thrown on him. And you know what he did for Samuel and Zelda when we got saved and we believed? He said, now you're righteous. And church, that's grace. And that's the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ. And that's how good he is this morning. I'm not going to say any more. I have more stuff to say. But I want you to walk out this morning knowing that you have the gift of righteousness. Would you give Jesus a hand and a praise in the hall this morning? Wow, I never thought I would take you to Sunday school in the way I did. So this is starts our journey towards a conference. This is Grace 101. You're in right standing with God.